we help keep kids safe and how do we teach them to keep themselves safe. Um, and it's really exciting to see that work happening. Um, not all programs were sort of um, created to um, be used within the school environment, although many of them can be, which is good. Um, you know, but, and what we're also noting is that there are programs that are meant to be used as sort of a, a universal sort of learning tool, but then also that are sort of aimed at more um, kind of at-risk um, youth. Um, and what we know right now, and what we heard a lot about this morning, is there's, there's really, um, the, the outcomes are, are looking, you know, really, really hopeful at this point that we are seeing that knowledge increases, the use of skill is, is increasing for kids and for others. Um, but you know, there's there's more work that needs to be done. From from a school based perspective, um, one of the challenges has been that schools are not always super keen to invite these programs into their schools for a variety of reasons. And if that's not happening, we might need to be thinking about why and how we could change that. Um, so that's that's one area of concern. For treatment, how do we detect and report? Doesn't sound like that's a treatment effort, but when you think about it from the perspective of you know, knowing who needs what, that's where really treatment has to start. It may include both case identification um, as well as just you know, sort of a, like a standard care model. Most programs um, that are related to this include sort of a professional development um, model that you know is is aimed at helping people to look for you know the warning signs and things like that. Um, th the reality is is that um, there is some evidence to suggest that um, there are some knowledge misunderstandings around how to report and when to report, and there are still some folks that really feel uncomfortable about reporting because it's just a heck of a phone call to make, right? And you certainly wouldn't want to get it wrong. Um, this is an old article, but when I read that 40% of teachers and administrators, again, in 1990 though, admitted to failing to report an incidence in maltreatment in their career, that's pretty concerning. I would certainly hope if they reran this that we would find that that's no longer the case. Um, but what we do find is that there is more reporting for kids with IEPs, mostly because one of the, the, the concerns about that is that it may just be because those kids are more at risk. But I also think some of it speaks to the culture of working with kids in that context, is there is more of sort of a case management emphasis on looking at the whole child because these kids often have needs in you know, multiple ways. But what we know is that the, the training efforts that we've tried um, haven't always delivered the results that we would like in terms of helping you know, folks to, um, to know when to report and to make reports when appropriate. So that's an area of need that we need to keep thinking about um, in, in the school setting. Well, once we know that a kid is in need, how do we, how do we help? Um, well, there are questions about whether or not school-based practitioners really have the requisite training to provide direct service to kids with these kinds of needs. Um, you know, not only is it related to providing trauma-related care, excuse me, but how to engage complicated family systems, how to engage with all of these other agencies that, you know, are, are working with children. And, um, I can say from a school psychology perspective, the pressures that we're under to train school psychologists to be able to do the other work that they need to do, trying to also train them in this area is just, um, we would probably not have students ever graduate or graduate in 10 years because there would just be this, this overwhelming load for them to have to learn. There are manualized programs, however, that do, do support teaching kids um, how, to, um, how to manage their emotions and, um, and so forth, like, like PADS and these other programs. They've not been studied specifically uh, within um, you know, those who've, who've experienced this, but um, it, we're hopeful that it would be a good you know, overall first step in helping kids um, and you know, sort of looking at the work that Carlo has done as well. This is you know, um, a, a, a need. One program that I did come across was the school success program that was really focused on more um, increasing the academic engagement and instruction of kids who've had these experiences as well. And so there is some hope there in terms of that. The uptake, though, of these programs is the problem. You know, we, we have a sense of what works, but, you know, paths is um, not the easiest 
thing to use in the school, um, and not that, not that you can't use it and you shouldn't use it. I would argue that you would. I think that schools sometimes really hesitate. When I was out on my internship, I walked into a guidance counselor's office and she had a wall full of the entire PADS curriculum. And it was neatly boxed on the shelf. <laughs> um, I, I very politely asked her why we weren't using it because I thought, gosh, that would be great. And she said, I can't get my teachers to do it. It's 45 minutes a day, it's just too much, and we have other things to focus on, and so, no, we're not using it. So, gorgeous curriculum sitting, sitting on a shelf. <laughs> it's just a little anecdote. How about maintenance? So, once a child has, um, once we know that, they, that they're having these problems and that they need support, how do we help with continued care? Um, so you've made the call, you're doing some paths or some other things that help support kids and you're really working hard as a school district, but n n you know, the, the question remains, now what? Um, one of the things that we have to consider is how to support the continued treatment and care coordination in the community, how to report and prevent future abuse, because what we unfortunately know is once it happens once, it often happens again. So, you know, always making sure that we're checking in. And also thinking about per different age levels for kids, the whole culture and context of the way teachers interact with students changes. So the identification of a person who can serve to monitor and to help to oversee all of this work within the school environment um, can be challenging. I think. Um, at the K to five level, it's a lot easier because kids are in one classroom most of the day, and they um, and you know they're um, more sort of um, you know aware of the everyday. At the middle school level, and middle schools that use sort of um, like a team-based um, way of teaching, that helps because at least all of the same teachers see all of the same kids, and they meet. Um, which helps and they're able to communicate through some of these issues, but at the high school level, it's sort of every man for themselves. I mean, um, so what happens is teachers typically team around their content area, but not necessarily around certain kids. While I think that there are some efforts to help with pre-referral with, um, you know, and, and the identification of kids at risk at the high school level, it's not a very seamless transition, and it's really challenging to think about who would serve to coordinate some of that care. So those are some things to think about. But um, what I would argue is that there needs to be a push to identify school-based case management, school-based case managers for kids who um, who have who who have experienced um, these issues and, and maltreatment. <clears throat> Pardon me. What does care coordination mean? You know, we, we've established that schools cannot be all things to all children. We've established that, they're, that they, are already, they are already complicated, stressed, socio-political systems that have a big job to do, so now what? Um, what I mean by a school-based case manager is four primary things. The first would be a person who serves as the primary contact for service providers who may be interacting with a child while on school grounds. Um, so, you know, the, the overall keeper of what's happening with, with these kids. Number two, serving in the role of consolidating information sort of across agencies. Where's kiddo living? Who are they living with? How are things going in treatment? Um, and, you know, what's happening with any sort of, um, you know, legal issues and that sort of thing in terms of can we sort of know that yeah, if kiddo has a court date in a week, we might want to be mindful of that, and that their, you know, their their arrangements might change after that time. And it would be helpful. It, it would be helpful if school-based personnel could be aware of that. Also, communicating the current therapy goals and techniques to whomever is at the school and working with the child. Sometimes we find that when a kiddo is working with someone from an outside agency, they're taught to take space or to take deep breaths or do whatever. And if school personnel aren't, aren't aware of that, sometimes kiddos get inadvertently punished for using those techniques because it doesn't fit with kind of what's happening in that particular classroom. Um, and you know, there are times I think where school-based personnel aren't really very understanding of the ways in which those could be used within the school environment and sometimes aren't always very kind about it. So we have to be thoughtful about that. And also providing, um, just doing continued monitoring and updates for those at the school, and then to communicate those to outside agencies as well. 
I, I think sometimes schools really like to collect information but don't always necessarily want to share, but I think that the communication will need to work in both directions in order to see that through. So how, how do we move forward? This is, this is a big job and it's a, it's a new way of thinking about how schools can serve kids. And it's not about a program, it's not about a manual, it's about a framework. And it's about thinking about in context, what can schools do at the local level and what makes sense given their needs. Um, so having said that, you know, we, we sort of are aware that the primary focus of programming has been on change in knowledge and skill gain tied to the educational program content. Um, there are some, uh, some mixed results for long-term maintenance, although that's changing to a degree. Um, but that our outcomes of interest in terms of how we move forward should be expanded to include, can we see if, that there are reductions in maltreatment incidences? and can we at least see increased rates of reporting, in particular at the school level. I think school personnel um, are in a, in a tight, um, complicated role where if you make a mandated report and you really upset a parent, you're gonna see that parent for the next six months and that might not be pleasant. I've, I've um, had some experiences with that, how that happens and it makes sense to me why it's challenging for schools to make that call even if they know that they have to. So what are the ways in which we can help to kind of support some of that so that we can see some increases in reporting? And more research is needed about the implementation and the readiness for implementation in schools. I think we need to have a better understanding of what we see uh, or what schools see as their needs in this area it's clear that they need coaching, it's clear that they need knowledge and they need support, but what that actually looks like, we're not exactly sure. It would be helpful to have an overall sense of what some of that looks like. Um, and it would be helpful to look at that from the perspective across all care levels. What do they need from the perspective of how to prevent, how to treat, and how to maintain? Um, and you know, those um, are, are things that I think we have hints of in some of the anecdotal, um, you know, content that we know about around, you know, how schools and agencies maybe work and play well with others or not work and play well with, with others as the case may be, but it would be nice to have more, um, more knowledge sort of overall from a more um, large scale perspective and empirical perspective. So just to wrap up, I think that um, we need to be moving towards a focus on human rights, social justice, and it just an, an overall health model in working with children who experience aversive childhood experiences in any form, not just maltreatment, to include things like poverty, um, and moving beyond the requirements of policy. So joining with community organizations, finding ways to establish collaborative and um, coordinated efforts for children that are intentional, that are sustainable, and that make sense. Um, and I would really invite um, you know, those of you who, who are working in schools to really think about what your organizational needs are. Is it training? Is it infrastructure? Is it community connections? Is it policies and procedures? You know, they're, they're, um, you know those, are, those are kind of the easy things sometimes to think about. Well, when you need to make a mandated report, who do you go to in your building and who follows up and what's the procedure? But there, there are even um, some issues about whether or not you know, there's, um, there's an awareness of what those needs are. And also to invite that we examine um, what, what our role is in looking at the needs of the whole child. So thank you, um, that's all I have. We're gonna be moving into our general discussion now, um, but if anyone has a question for Dr. Hall, um, directly on the heels of what she was just talking about, please feel free to go to the mic. Sorry. <laughs> oh. Way to go, Carlo. <clears throat> oh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I was wondering if either of you could speak to the role that um, school policies might exacerbate um, symptoms of externalized behavior, internalized behaviors, um, and how we can have effective policies um, to keep kids safe without re-traumatizing them or uh, exacerbating their symptoms. Um, I guess I'll, I'll start. Um, 
I, I would say that um, at a very sort of basic level, the thing about policy change and about school procedures is that they're a really quick and fast way of letting people know what the boundaries are. But then what happens is when we start using them like without thinking about what the intent was behind the policy, that's when things start to get a little bit dicey. Um, so I would say that you know, my perspective as a school psychologist is that at minimum we need to be thinking about what is in place to support social emotional learning at a universal level for all kids. Trauma, no trauma, poverty, no poverty. We all need to have a common language and kids need to have a common language and teachers need to have a common language about how we think about how to help kids work through strong feelings, how we help kids think about their needs and the needs of others and to work through these things in a way that makes sense. I think once that's in place, I think then we can start talking about things like, you know, timeout procedures, zero tolerance policies, expulsion policies, and so forth. But I think that there are some, um, there are some ways in which what happens with school discipline policy even within a school-wide positive behavior support framework is the focus still is on the externalizers. So where is our screening for who are, who are having more of those you know, quiet needs that we don't necessarily know about? And, and, and are we actively looking for those kids and thinking about what their needs are? Um, and then I think I would also say um, that they're probably for kids who've been maltreated and kids who've experienced really any trauma um, my sense would be that those kids require a more individualized and tailored approach to how, um, how schools handle when they're having a bad day. Um, you know, I've heard a lot of stories about things like, you know, there was a kid with autism who held a hammer on the playground, they shut down the entire school and called the cops and sent him home, which further reinforced his school avoidance behavior. My gosh, talk about a disruption to an entire school day on the basis of a policy that sort of made good sense, but maybe if somebody had taken a minute to think about, wait a minute, this kid you know, is really just kind of trying to get out of school here. Let's, let's think about a way in which we can get the hammer away from him, <laughs> right? Um, and so th those are the kinds of things where I think at sort of the, the tier three service level when you have kids who have these needs, we, we really need to be thinking about the individual child at that level. And then are there ways in which we can relax or reinterpret school policy um, in, in light of those individual needs. Does that help? Thank you, yeah. Carla, you can speak to it as well. Carla, do you want? Sure, I mean, just to add to that, you know, you mentioned discipline policies, I think. Um, anecdotally, one of the things that I think uh, is a problem in schools that don't think about um, discipline policies in terms of being trauma-informed is that, and I understand too there's a difficulty with confidentiality and sharing information with child welfare. Um, you know, when I was working as a, um, a therapist in the community, working with a special education teacher uh, on one of my clients and helping them understand, you know, trauma-informed care, their policy would, would, would time out, for example, meant that this child who was dysregulated in the classroom would be sent into a timeout room. In essence, it was exclusion practice that exacerbated a lot of the symptoms that this child already had because of the maltreatment. Now, having to navigate that is challenging because how much from, from a clinical perspective and even from a child welfare perspective, how much information do you share that's necessary for the teacher to be able to understand they can't do that with this particular child or with any children who have experienced traumatic um, histories in the past. But I think this is one of the reasons why I want to advocate for the developmental framework. Oh, hello. Keep touching them. Doesn't like the development. Yeah. Do you want to? Okay. Sorry about that. How many of you guys woke up because of that? <laughs> um, so, hello. Hey, it's time for Carl to go. <laughs> um, it, you know, it. I think it, it, the one reason why I wanted to advocate for a more developmentally informed framework is that we can bring in a, a trauma-informed approach because we can understand what are some of these regulatory mechanisms that are impacted by trauma that can be the, the targets of mechanisms so that discipline policies can be implemented to shift that rather than, in this case, for example, putting the child in a timeout room that actually worked against them, their symptoms worsened and it wasn't taking into account you know, their maltreatment histories. I think we're doing a disservice. 
Um, I was wondering when you um, went through the notion of emotional and social education, if you had looked at Comer's school reform method and how you think that um, answers some of the need um, in its general framework. And then secondly, I was curious to know to what degree you infused racial bias into uh, the work and thoughts that you've presented. Thank you, I appreciate you raising that issue. Um, I'm actually not as familiar with that particular school reform um, program or framework, I guess I should say, but I'd, I'd, like to, I'd like to learn more about it. But I would say that that is one of the challenges we have with some of these you know, SEL programs is they were sort of normed on and designed for white middle class people um, who you know, sort of share a common language and so forth. And it isn't really very well understood how well that transplants um, into, um, you know, very impoverished environments, rural and very conservative environments, um, linguistically diverse environments, and a as well as those those areas that are that that are ethnically diverse. I think some of the work around culturally responsive practice in general and how to modularize evidence-based treatments on the basis of what do we think are the core agents of change and then what are the elements that could be tailored and adopted to be more contextually appropriate and culturally responsive is really going to be important in this kind of work. I, I really want to emphasize that I think that in my work as sort of an interdisciplinary and translational researcher, it is very clear that we can't just mail programs to school districts without any regard to the culture and the norms within that community. When I worked in El Paso, Texas, um, in, I was working in outpatient mental health. Um, we were using the Russell Barkley curriculum. I think it was the, the defiant child, you know, defiant teen curricula. And in a heav heavily Mexican population, some of the notions of sticker charts and token economies and things just didn't really ring true for those folks. And so it was a really, um, really interesting learning experience when the state was telling us as an agency, you will use this program because it's the evidence-based program. But then I'm trying to deliver it in very good faith, recognizing that it just it just isn't working and isn't responsive. So um, I would say that that's going to be a continued challenge. And this is why I think more of these local efforts to understand your own capacity, your own needs, and your own culture, and then looking at practices that, that might be a good fit or that might work better for your needs. And what are the, eight, what are the, um, what are the aspects of, of those measures that you're going to use or those, the, those um, you know, whatever you're, you're gonna be using in your school, how might that really work to be a more um, sort of contextually appropriate fit? So, so thank you for raising that issue, it is important. Go ahead. Hi, um, I just, I'm a general pediatrician from Hershey and was just curious in, in listening to your presentation, which was great, as to how you see pediatricians maybe helping you or maybe not helping you at all in what you do. I recently finished a series of focus groups related to whole child health with school nurses and parents and teachers and administrators and a lot of what we heard was that there really is no communication and I think I feel that way too. And the few times I've managed to talk to a school counselor, it's like, wow, like we're actually talking to each other. So I'm just curious. Um, I'll, I'll start with a story. Uh, my my great-grandmother always used to say, there's a story behind that. Um, we, we had an incident, well, not, not an incident. There was a policy at a school district that said that school psychologists were not permitted to identify students as having any of the DSM, you know, whatever, whatever issues. So um, there was a mother who went to her pediatrician and said, I think my child has ADHD. I'd like your help to make that identification. And the, the pediatrician said, and I thought, 
quite wisely so, well, your school psychologist would be in a much better position to make that evaluation because they can observe the child in school and can be talking with you and working more collaboratively with the teacher. So why don't you just have your local 